Okay, good evening. Uh, I feel as though I should start in an American announcer's voice with in last week's <laughs> thrilling episode. <laughs> For those of you who caught last Friday's broadcast, we actually looked at Patrick Murray and Gene Shuler's false moves in philosophy and social theory, and that sets up tonight's broadcast, which is on the companion book, Philosophical and Political Consequences of the Critique of Political Economy, Recognising Capital. The link to that book, incidentally, is in the chat box. With us again, the same crew, because we can't afford to get anybody else, and they were cheap. <laughs> so, this book is a companion volume written by Patrick Murray, who is the John C. Kenneflick Faculty Chair in the Humanities and Professor of Philosophy at Crichton University, Omaha, Nebraska, USA. The author recently of The Mismeasure of Wealth, Essays on Marx and Social Form and Marx's Theory of Scientific Knowledge. His research interests are in the relationship between capitalism and modern philosophy and include the British empiricists Hegel, Marx and the Frankfurt School. And for people who are friends of historical materialism, Patrick is no stranger. Alongside him is Jean Schuler, the Professor of Philosophy at Crichton University probably why they're writing it together, good proximity, published on the history of philosophy and critical theory, including articles on Hume, Kant, Hegel, Marx, Aaron, Iris Murdoch, and Habermas. And she's currently working on a series of articles on Hegel and modern philosophy. And a discussant. Ruth Groff is Associate Professor of Political Science and affiliated faculty with the Department of Philosophy at St. Louis University. She's the author of A Critical Introduction to Causal Powers and Dispositions and Ontology Revisited, Metaphysics and Social and Political Philosophy. Tony Smith is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy and Political Science, Iowa State University. He's, amongst his many publications, are Beyond Liberal Egalitarianism, Marx and Normative Social Theory in the 21st Century, Globalization, a Systematic Marxian Account, and we're all looking forward uh, in a book which I know is shortly, hopefully, to come out through Absolutely. Brill and then Haymarket, which is a socialism for the 21st century towards the full and free development of every individual. That will be coming out under HM or Historical Materialism's imp imprint. And last but certainly not least is Tom Geno, who's Professor of Philosophy at Gonzaga University, Spokane, Washington. His publications include Personalism, Atheism and Marxist Humanism, The Enduring Significance of the Thought of Karl Marx, Rea Dunaskaeva's Concept of the, the, the Ultimate Reality and Meaning, and a marx Jewy Dialogue on the Prospects of an American Socialism. And Tom's working on moral philosophy, personalism, philosophical hermeneutics, Hegelian Marxism and critical theory. So... A really august panel for this broadcast. My name is Paul Reynolds. I'm an editor with Historical Materialism, and I have the privilege of chairing this. So hopefully you'll hear as little from me as possible. OK, so last week we were left on the precipice, as all good end of part ones were, where we knew the false moves. Now we're relying on Patrick and Jean to take us the way of enlightenment, Take it away, please. Thank you, Paul. Uh, well, one of the consequences of uh, um, a critique of political economy, a critique of factory philosophy, is an appreciation of good concepts and uh, uh, inferior ones, rich concepts and poor concepts. It's just so to um, anchor that distinction, because as philosophers, we're interested in concepts, and a good concept is a concept that creates space for, for thinking, for asking questions, for making connections between parts of experience. Good concepts are inherently anti-demarcationist. That is, they really resist bifurcations. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the critique of political economy, I think, opens up some good concepts that makes it possible for us to um, 
to see how profoundly uh, relevant the the critique is for all areas of of knowledge. So I'm just going to use as an example of a of a poor concept the the pencil uh, as seen as just a thing with properties. That's a poor concept. It's okay, or as a product of labor, made of wood, r- rubber, graphite. Um, what makes for a a better concept to see this pencil as a commodity, because if you see a pencil as a, or what we're calling an X commodity, because it's been purchased and it's being used to grade my papers. Um, but the commodity versus the product is really um, a, a good place to start because a commodity has these two dimensions. It's useful uh, and it has a price. I had to buy it. Uh, And uh, these two dimensions really open up sort of very interesting aspects of the world. Um, It also brings up the point that I had to buy it. I needed money. And so in order to to acquire something to grade my papers, I needed to have a job, which meant I had to have qualifications going to a job market years ago when... (laughs) to find a job in philosophy so that I could be paid money. And with that money, I can purchase um, commodities to meet my needs. Um, and the, the pencil itself has a, has a price and the price uh, allows this little uh, commodity to be compared to every other commodity on earth, uh, to be compared to bananas in Guatemala, to be compared to, to, to steel, to be compared to, um, Apple phones. Uh, it's a kind of wonderful feature of commodities that they have this ability to be compared universally, globally. And how is that possible? Uh, when you talk about a product of labor, none of those questions arise because a product of labor is just simply uh, doesn't open up that space for asking what does a price measure, for talking about value, that all things exist as value and value can sort of be a, a, a substance of a peculiar nature, abstract uh, labor. And uh, that can sort of be exist in all, all commodities on earth. Um, so uh, the, the strangeness and interesting dimensions of me being a salaried professional who's labor power is exchanged for a salary and purchasing to meet my needs of commodities on a market that have been produced all over the world by strangers. Everything in my mouth, on my body, in my room is produced by people all over the world who I don't know, but I am definitely in relation to this global society of labor that is present. To, to bring commodities into our um, sort of everyday vocabulary so we don't just see things on our desk, we th- see things that were purchased and that this represents a presence of other human beings in the world under all sorts of different conditions, bringing these useful things to me. And also already you can see one of the really interesting issues in our world, the difference between my use of money to buy things to meet needs, and then the money is gone. And the money of this Ticonderoga maker of pencils, whose goal is not to meet my needs primarily, is to make money and expand their uh, 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 use of uh, capital, to accumulate capital. And that's, that's all there in the commodity. And that's all there in the difference between talking about a product which is a general concept, nothing wrong with it. It's just poor. It says very little in talking about a commodity. And so what we're really interested in today is the critique of political economy brings into our life without being a scholar of Marx. You don't have to be a scholar of Marx to have better concepts that allow space for questions, for thinking, for making connections, and they aren't dull and boring and dismal kind of concepts. So uh, let's take it back to uh, false moves, factoring philosophy, the bourgeois horizon. So 
uh, the bourgeois horizon that Marx talks about, he really has in mind as a horizon of thinking that uh, is there for most modern philosophers and for um, classical and he anticipates neoclassical economics with his critique of Samuel Bailey. And uh, the, the idea of the bourgeois, uh, the bourgeois horizon is really brought about by what we're calling factoring philosophy, which separates things that can be distinguished, but really aren't separable. And so uh, that's what we call a phenomenological mistake. So the critique of political economy, Marx's critique of political economy, the core of it uh, is the separation of needs, labor, wealth, production from their constitutive social forms and purposes. And that leaves, uh, that, that puts them uh, in the illusion, what we call the illusion of the economic, as if there was an economy or uh, a form of production that was just production in general, uh, an economy in general. Now, this uh, this goes along really with the understanding, or uh, I would say misunderstanding, of Marx as uh, holding a Ricardian labor theory of value. So the Ricardian theory of value really is caught in the bourgeois horizon because it's really a the labor, as it's understood in the Ricardian theory or the classical uh, labor theory of value, is just a transhistorical conception of labor. It's not tied to any particular social forms or purposes. And uh, that really cuts off, uh, that really cuts off the ability, and this is how a, a, a discourse, a, a discursive horizon works, is it illuminates some things and it and it keeps others out of view. But the kind of concepts Gene was just talking about uh, that relate to what we could call the value forms that are specific to capital, those are cut off when you, when you uh, really look at, at a mode of production as something that's in general, or wealth as wealth in general, labor, labor in general. All that is lost. And I think uh, I, uh, I, I Rubin was one of the first people, I think, who really captured this when he he said that the basic error of the majority of Marx's critics, I would say a lot of Marx's followers uh, could be added, consists of their complete failure to grasp the qualitative sociological side of Marx's theory of value. Yeah, but that's because they don't recognize the Marx's theory of value as a theory of the social form of value, of, of labor, excuse me, uh, the social form of labor, and consequently, uh, the, there are no there are no qualitative social sociological or social uh, consequences for social theory to pursue. So in this book, we're trying to uh, pursue some of those uh, pursue some of those qualitative things. Now, some of the other things that that go uh, that go by the wayside. I think you can't understand Marx's comment that value is purely social. I think you you can't you can't make sense of the value form. That's the idea that that uh, value is necessarily expressed as money, and therefore uh, uh, a commercial economy has to be a mon has to be a monetary economy. And I don't think you can really understand things like uh, subsumption. Uh, what do you subsume things under? Social forms. If you don't have the concept of the social form of labor production, well, then subsumption as a rubric just doesn't make much sense. Uh, shadow forms, shadows of constitutive forms, they don't make much sense if you don't have the constitutive forms within the discursive horizon to begin with. Um, I don't think you can understand the fetish character of the commodity money and capital uh, without uh, seeing that it's grounded in the particular social form of labor. So uh, what we're trying to do by, what, what we're trying to show is how the critique of, of political economy by making this critique that it's, it's ignoring, overlooking, ignoring uh, the social forms and purposes of uh, production of commodities production in a capitalist society uh, is 
really uh, limiting uh, social theory tre tremendously. Uh, the subtitle of this book is Recognizing Capital. And we have a chapter six on uh, reclaiming the concepts of capital and value. Marx says that the development of the concept of capital is uh, really the foundational uh, task for social theory. But since, since capital really is value that is valorized, he sometimes calls it self-valorizing value, well, then you can't understand <laughs> You can't understand capital without understanding value. So we have we have two uh, fundamental concepts here: value and capital, that I think are very poorly understood, uh, even by you know people who are very progressive. So uh, Paul, you mentioned Tony's book uh, Beyond uh, uh, Liberal Egalitarianism. The, the thrust of that book is here's a, a lot of you know, impressive theorists, they just don't have the concept of capital. I would say uh, a book that made quite a splash, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, uh, Piketty, I don't think, I don't think he has the concept of capital. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a big, this is a huge lack. And then all of the, what Rubin was referring to as the kind of sociological richness that can really be developed out of Marx's theory of value, which takes you into money, takes you into capital, necessarily, that's all, that's all really lo lost. Or if it's there, it's there kind of untethered to the fundamental concepts that really uh, should, be, should be grounding the, the, those things. Um, in chapter six, uh, we talk about some misconceptions, three with regard to value and two with regard to capital. So one is, uh, so one is uh, value is not utility. Well, we talked some about utility in our last session. Uh, we regard utility as a pseudo concept. So certainly not uh, something that can be uh, the answer to what is, what is value. There's a couple of other reasons why it can't be. One of, the, one of the things, one of the basic problems with the Ricardian or classical theory of value is it sees value as transhistorical. We'll always have value with us. And if you think about a post-capitalist society, then you have to think in terms not of getting rid of value, but of redistributing it somehow. Uh, that that's, that's got to function in the how, how one is considering a post-capitalist society. So there's implications for, uh, for that uh, kind of the thinking about and the politics of any kind of post-capitalist world. So value is not utility. It's not use value. Okay. I think you could say in neoclassical economics that ultimately value is use value or utility. Uh, and value is not exchange value or price. So uh, what Marx argues is that value is necessary. The value form argument is value is necessarily expressed as price in money, but it's expressed as something other than what it is. That's kind of the Hegelian logic of essence. Uh, the essence must appear as something other than itself, and that's and that's what we have. That's what we have there. Uh, capital. We talked a little bit last time. Capital is not just any resource. It's not. Uh, it's not just a resource that can be used in producing new resources, as you could read in many economics text, textbooks. That's got really nothing in particular to do about with capitalism. It just doesn't. It's just a general, I mean, resources, yeah, we have resources of all types. Uh, we have reason in, in any society where you're producing new useful things, you're going to have uh, produce resources that will be used in the production of new resources. Tells you nothing really about uh, capital. And uh, capitalism is also not a system of instrumental action. So uh, capitalism is not McDonaldization. McDonaldization is a way of thinking about a capitalist society really based on a kind of neo-Weberian conception of 
uh, instrumental reason, instrumental action. Labor in capitalism is not instrumental action. Uh, labor in capitalism is surplus value producing action, uh, labor. And that's, uh, that's something different. And in fact, uh, uh, we've argued that uh, instrumental reason is actually uh, a, a pseudo concept. So that's another, another reason why a capitalist society can't really be thought of as a society dominated by, by uh, instrumental reason. I, I, just a, another word on, on social forms. Um, uh, it's it has a sort of um, uh, abs, uh, esoteric sound, but I think one way to think about it is that you can take some general features of what it means to be human, uh, like we have needs, like we are social, that like we um, uh, have to labor on nature to meet our needs. Uh, what social form means is that those social those general features. You could call them universals, never exist as general, as universal. They always exist in a particular historical materialist form. So labor is, I'm a serf, I'm a slave, I'm a peasant, I'm a, I'm a, a, a factory worker, I'm a salaried professional. The social form is taking these generals down to the level of a particular historical context in which my needs for food aren't met by my, in my garden, but are met by taking my salary to the grocery store and purchasing my food. So social form is really just the concreteness of the uh, ways in which generalities exist. And they only exist in the concrete form of particularity. Particularity not severed from the general, but particularity as an expression of the general. I know we're, we're running a little short on time here, but I want to say something about our chapter on uh, the commodity spectrum. Uh, I always used to, in teaching uh, the beginning of capital, I, I, in the classroom, I, I asked my students, look around the classroom, do you see anything here that's not a commodity? And the smart ones would say, yeah, all of us. Okay, good. Uh, and not fortunate, but, but uh, not much else. But uh, Gene uh, pointed out that actually uh, everything in the room is pretty much X commodities and that uh, we have to really think in terms of things in a capitalist society, the general rule is that things are produced as commodities, but uh, once they're sold, then what? And so in this, so this is a kind of speculative essay, this commodity spectrum, and we're trying to, this one's kind of pushing uh, beyond uh, what you can read in Marx in, in some places, but root, rooted in it. Uh, and so, you know, trying to bring out, uh, so we use the term com capitalist commodity to describe any commodity that's in a capitalist society. They're not, not every commodity in a capitalist society is produced by a capitalist firm. Mm -hmm. uh, commodity capital is a term that's too little known. Uh, one of the points in the results of the immediate production process that Marx makes is that when you look back, what you realize is that when we started with the commodity, what we were really starting with for the most part was commodity capital. That's to say a commodity that was a bearer of surplus value. Um, one of the things we, you know, there are, there's, there's little attention paid even to the commodity form. There are some social critics, I think of Sandel, Deborah Satz, uh, Elizabeth Anderson, a few people who kind of revived the, the old simony critique, like what should be, right? So what should be a commodity? Are there things that shouldn't be a commodity? And uh, that, that's good. It brings some attention at least to uh, a social, a social form, but but a crucial thing, I think, with Marx is in Capital is showing that circulation presupposes the, circ the circulation of money and commodities presupposes the circulation of capital. So you could put it this way. The value form analysis is no money, no value. Uh, this point is no surplus value, no value, just to really make them short. Mm -hmm. And therefore... Uh, these critics of, of you know, the, ex the limits of what should be commodified, what shouldn't, they generally not seeing that point. 
And uh, so they're not extending their critique really beyond the level of, you know, what should be the scope of commodification to the questions, the many questions that are raised when we move to the to the capital uh, level. Maybe, maybe one more point. <laughs> the, um, the qualitative nature of the commodity use value is a qualitative uh, term that is that measures the physical properties of things in relation to the human needs and desires. Okay, so the qualitative, which is seemingly extinguished in the circuits of capital <laughs> and is, um, is really always there in the circuit of consumption in life. You know, the qualitative is how we as human beings exist in the world. <clears throat> so X commodity sounds like a kind of failure, but it is actually the measure of where we as human beings are living in the world with one another and making our way and oftentimes making our way by resisting this sort of um, spiral of capital circulating, which is endless, ongoing, powerful, but not the whole story of what it means to be a human being. Because what it means to be a human being is you have to have a life. And that life, it could come under siege in so many ways. But having a life is utterly and fundamentally a qualitative process, okay, which cannot ever be simply usurped by the, the capital spiral. Households are full of qualitative realities. Let's, uh, let's leave it there. Huh? Okay, thank you very much indeed. We have our Marxists in the arena. Now let's uh, let the lions on them. Who is the first lion to speak? I guess that's me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, again, uh, this is an incredib another incredibly uh, rich collection of papers. Uh, way more than uh, we can get to uh, this afternoon. Uh, it has many of the same strengths as the book last week. Uh, the discussion of uh, major figures in the history of philosophy is just excellent. Uh, the skeptics and Hegel especially, uh, Hume and so on, are, are talked about uh, in illuminating ways, tremendously illuminating in clear ways. Uh, what's, what, what's One thing that's different in this book is the discussion of art forms. And so the relationship between a social theory uh, and the appreciation of different uh, art uh, is in here. Uh, and that's you know just done in a paradigma paradigmatic way. Uh, there are chapters on Dickens, uh, uh, an, an overview of the films of Stanley Kubrick, an overview of the films of Woody Allen, uh, and, and treating them seriously as having philosophical and political views and uh, treating them as having philosophical and political views that need to be critiqued. Uh, so if you're interested in that sort of a, a, a approach uh, to culture, uh, you know, the sort of the politics of culture, uh, this is a book very much uh, that should be a very much interest. Uh, now, what I want to do in, in, in the time I have is just uh, talk about a couple of, of what I took to be major themes. And uh, in, in two cases, just three points. Uh, in two cases, ask you to maybe push a little bit beyond what's in the book, uh, try to draw out some implications. And then in the third case, uh, uh, just talk about uh, what I took to be by far the most provocative claim in the book. All right. So uh, the first point has to do with uh, the topic you've, you've already brought up in your in your presentation, uh, just um, what capital is and how it comes about. And so uh, the book presents a very clear uh, a, a account of, of Marx's theory on this. Right. So. What's weird about the modern period is that social relations are in a very historically specific sort of social form. And uh, we can talk about it, sometimes Patrick and Jean use the term a social sociality, which is an apparent paradox. Uh, but we have a mode of production. We have a we have a set of production and, and property relations that are based upon privately undertaken production. And the privately undertaken production has to be validated as being social production. And the only way it can be validated as social production is through sale for money. And so we have a society where this endless cir circulation of money investment and production, and then the sale of the produced goods, and then more money being invested in more production and more sale of produced goods. And when you have social relations in that historically specific weird form of privately undertaken production that has to be validated through sale for money, then we have this weird thing happen. We have capital as a strange sort of alien force 
above human society. I mean, we all we all think we have this theory of evolution that ends up with human species as the dominant thing on the planet. Well, Marx's point is we're not the dominant thing on the planet anymore, right? Uh, there's been a process of social evolution and social evolution has taken this weird twist where this non-personal thing that's not a thing, just a sort of for an impersonal force is now on an ontological level above us. It emerges like out of human society behind the backs of social agents. Uh, there's a brilliant description of what capital is on page 41 of the book. Capital is the actuality of the of coercive rule by abstraction, which I think goes right to the heart. I mean, that's the best one sentence summary of the first part of capital maybe I've ever seen. Uh, okay, so here's, here's uh, anybody who's interested in understanding that argument should read this book. Here's just the question to just sort of push it, an implication of it. It seems to me a pretty clear implication here is this is not just a critique of capitalist market societies. This is a critique of market societies full stop. So from this point of view, it doesn't matter if we get rid of capitalists as a class. It doesn't matter if we have means of production where everybody becomes a capitalist because everybody is distributed an equal share of equity. And so they're like owned by everybody. And it doesn't matter if the state owns the means of production. And it doesn't matter if local communities own the means of production. And it doesn't matter if worker cooperatives own their mean of production. As long as we have this sort of arrangement where we have private production that has to be socially validated through sale for money, you're going to get capital as an emergent higher level in, uh, impersonal force over society. So to me, out of this book, you don't talk about it in the book, but to me, it's a devastating critique of market socialism as a project because it implies that market socialism is a world of capital without capitalists. And so again, this is not explicitly talked about in the book, but I think in terms of our discussion about where to push the book, that might be one way to go. A second point I wanted to talk about comes from one of the most interesting things in the book, where there are a lot of interesting books, Once uh, interesting things. Once we have capital as a subject over human society, then the question is, well, how does it dominate, right? What are the ways in which it dominates the society in which it emerged from? And in their presentation, Jane and Patrick already introduced the term subsumption. And one of the great contributions of this book to Marxian theory is a systematic presentation of the different forms of subsumption under capital. So they come into two categories. There's subsumption under the constitutive forms of capital. And so we're familiar, most of us are familiar with formal subsumption, right? Where, where means of production are, are commodities and the labor process is part of the capital process. Um, and then, and then we have a second type called real subsumption, where the means of production and the labor process and the products of the labor process are not just part of the capital valorization process, but they are actually materially transformed to further capital's end, to further the good of capital. And then we have this interesting concept of ideal subsumption, which is where we take a form of capital and apply it outside circuits of capital. Capital's reach extends outside its circuits. So we can treat housework as if we can ask how much is household worth, work worth? How much does household labor contribute to GDP? Uh, that's ideal subsumption under capital. We can talk about uh, how much how much of the contributions of nature to society and try to put put a price tag on that. That's ideal subsumption under capital um, and so on. And then we have a, a concept that's introduced in the book, but not discussed, of hybrid subsumption. Uh, I come from Iowa, so the family farmer is a classic case of hybrid subsumption. They own the land. They own their means of production. The agribusiness firms tell them every single thing they have to do when they have to do it. So their labor is, is really subsumed under capital without being formally subsumed. So it's a type of hybrid subsumption. I think this category is extremely important because it extends to uh, the, the, the farce of the independent contractor, right? Who, who is supposed to be an entrepreneur and yet depends upon capitalist firms for 
basically everything, right? The, the labor process, when they can work, what how they work, and so on. Uh, so hybrid, hybrid subsumption is a very important category too. And then we have the two types of subsumption under shadow forms. Uh, so one of them is the shadow forms that track uh, the constitutive forms. So I think the examples of those would be egalitarianism, because when we're formally subsumed under capital, we capital society is contractual, and so we're treated as free and equal con contractors. And so egalitarianism becomes a, a shadow form of capital uh, in your reading. And then there's uh, the one shadow forms you talked about before of McDonaldization, efficiency, calculability, predictability, control. Uh, these are, uh, the, you know, th these are shadow forms of capital's real subsumption of our actions. Uh, and then there's another category of shadow forms where they don't track the constitutive forms of capital, but they're just complete illusions that capital generates. Uh, and so your examples of those are instrumental reason, uh, utility, uh, wealth without any social form. Uh, so I think this is a brilliant typology. I think it's incredibly helpful for understanding our social world. I think everybody should read this book to make sense of our social world. Uh, but I think maybe the question is whether it needs to be pushed a little bit further or added a little bit further, because conspicuously absent from here is what I take to be an increasingly important part of capital's reach is that, uh, well, political forms. Right. Uh, the state. Right. This is a, this this account is really based on capital. But Marxist Marxist systematic theory has unwritten parts to it. There was supposed to be a book on the state. Um, are the state this in some sense, the state has political forms that also subsume society separate from the in some sense, distinct from capital's forms of subsumption? Uh, but it's also the case that, cap that the state's political forms are themselves subsumed by capital's forms. Uh, it gets really complicated very fast. Um, but I think, I think the point I want to make here is in, in our contemporary world, capital's forms seem to more and more require political forms. Right. So if you look, for instance, at who's making profit in the capitalist economies, like I, I read somewhere like 50 percent of capitalist firms don't make profits. And if you look at the profits in U.S. capitalism, there's the big seven. There's like seven companies <laughs> and they basically make this is a little exaggerated, but they basically make all the profits. So how do they make the profits? Well, you don't have to look very far to see they make the profits because uh, the state is is paying for all the basic research and the state is paying for all the risky research and the state is paying for all the long-term research, basically. Uh, and then the state assigns, lets these companies get private property rights to intellectual property and, and make money out of artificially created monopolies uh, through the state's intellectual property rights. And if you got rid of the state's artificial monopolies by intellectual property rights, there probably would be no profits anywhere in the capitalist system. Capitalism's inherent dynamism, I think, of making profits on its own without political forms has is exhausted. And it requires the state, I think. Uh, and I think also the dominant form of our, the state today is, well, what do we do for other types of capital besides those with the big seven? Well, th there's financialization and... Uh, the inflation of capital assets kicks in. Uh, well, that's not a market-driven process, right? Um, the inflation of the inflation, the profit you get from financial assets is a completely politicized process with political forms every step of the way. Uh, you don't get an inflation of capital assets without the, that whole process of creating debt to be spent on securities, which can then you can get more debt to buy securities at a profit to the people who have them, and then other other financial firms can get in can get more debt so that they can buy those financial assets from the previous owners, and you can get M going to M prime that way. Uh, that only works if the if there's if the state creates collateral that these companies can use when they borrow, and so I've seen I've seen the descriptions of the state. And the, and the Fed in particular, as becoming a collateral factory, 
That's not, I didn't make that phrase up, but it's a very striking phrase. What the Fed does is it, it creates collateral uh, that allows the shadow banks and the hedge funds and so on to borrow uh, and then be able to take that money that they borrow to inflate up the value of capital assets and they can keep the profits churning in the financial sector. And that's that's the way our system works today, right? The state is a collateral generating machine, a collateral factory. And then that all can only work if basically the state guarantees the financial sector that there won't be a catastrophic loss of these values uh, by, by basically guaranteeing a bailout. So again, if you look at the dominant forms of capital accumulation in our day, which is through like Facebook and Google and so on, and then the dominant and, and then the dominant form of accumulation through hedge funds and the shadow banking system, uh, these aren't just capital forms in some narrow sense, right? Th these are political forms that have been incorporated as part of a capital process. Uh, in a basically intrinsic and essential way that I think reflects in one sense capital's exhaustion as a dynamic mode of production on its own. Um, but anyway, to, to put it in the form of a question, <laughs> would you be, I mean, do you think that this typology of forms of subsumption, uh, you know, could be supplemented with a typology of political forms of subsumption? Uh, and then the third point, and I'll, I'll just, this again is going to, uh, I think be the most provocative thing of the book. Let me just read a, a couple of statements that made me go, whoa. <laughs> so on page 56, you write, uh, you, you're, you're in, a, in a dialogue with Nancy Frazier, you write, we further criticize Frazier for not distinguishing between the institutionalization of racism or sexism in our capitalist economy, which is all too real, and what is a necessary feature of a capitalist economy. And then on page 57, uh, it seems to me that not only are sexism, racism, and homophobia not necessary for capitalism, the fundamental capitalist forms point to their eventual undoing, which is a very strong predictive claim. <laughs> uh, so um, this is obviously a huge debate, but let me just throw out, uh, I mean, there's the historical fact right, that capitalism has always been accompanied by structural racism, right? So, so that just seems a given historical fact. Uh, so that's one thing that you'd have to explain, right? Why, it, if this relationship is as contingent as you make it sound in those passages, um, why has it been so historically connected? Uh, and this gets into a bigger debate about even wage labor as a social form. Uh, it turns out that in, in capitalism, there's all this historical research, how, how unique contractual relationships of free, of, of even formally and legally free wage labor is to certain sectors of cap, certain regions of capitalism at certain periods of time. So in lots of other regions in a, in a general capitalist global system, different types of bonded labor have been prevalent. And uh, even today, there's like tens of millions of people who are literally enslaved, who are yet engaged in value production, value producing labor. So, so wage labor, um, I mean, that, so that's one question, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of issues here, right? Just, just how much is the legal freedom of wage labor uh, and equality, contractual equality of wage labor a, a really... Um, you know, really part of concrete capitalism versus the abstract level of volume one. Uh, and then there's the issue of whether, whether the need, whether there is a systematic essential tendency in capitalism to divide the working class and to divide those suffering from capitalist exploitation. Uh, I mean, and, and again, it seems if you have a system that's going to generate unemployment, it's going to generate a reserve army, it's going to generate a surplus population, it's going to generate global inequality, global poverty on a very severe level. Uh, you, if you could, if you could give like some people who are exploited certain benefits, some some material, some symbolic, and if you could systematically deny the material benefits and symbolic benefits to other groups of people, uh, and that would seem like it might have a claim to be an essential determination of capitalism, right? That, that capitalism has a systematic tendency to create an other. 
right? Rather than, and, and so this idea of egalitarianism as being a, a constitutive form, right? Even in a, in a, in a limited sense, uh, I guess that would be what, what the debate would be about, right? Um, it claims that, but in reality, what it does is it creates, it also has a systematic tendency for us versus them. Now, who the other is can change, right? So for a long time, it was the Irish. And then for some, for lots of historical reasons, it stopped being the Irish. Uh, it was always Africans and African-Americans, and it hasn't ever stopped being them. Uh, there's some contingency, but that capital needs and other might not be that contingent. It, it might not have to be a tendency to overcome all forms of systematic discrimination. Just a, an item for discussion. <laughs> all right, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Tony. Certainly some provocative discussion there, which I hope will excite our audience. Ruth, would you like to come forth? Yep, thank you. So I, I pretty much agree with everything, almost everything Tony said. <laughs> um, so could just leave it at that. But um, So let's say, you know, with the first book, I really liked it. But I, I think above all, I liked the kind of book that it that it is, and the kind of project, um, which I had just, you know, described as radical in in a really exciting way. But um, it's sort of as though you guys solved for x, and I would have solved for y, like I, I had real reservations about the content of the story that was told, but I loved the form of it. This book, um, I think there's less um, explicit connection to that story of the first book. And so one could just read it as a wonderful collection of brilliant articles about Marx and about capital and about capitalism. And it's it, it is that I loved, especially the central um, chapters. And Tony points us to that, the sentence on page 41, but there's just endless ones that are wonderful. I teach a seminar on volume one and we don't have any secondary assigned reading, but I may start assigning some of these chapters. Um, they're, you know, they're just wonderful um, flat out. And I don't really have anything much to say. I mean, it, it, maybe in, I have one one question I'll raise or one point to push, but mostly I think you one could think of this as just sort of a brilliant exposition of it. If we had to push it to the level of con more general concept, then maybe the concept of social form, um, you know, wouldn't have to be connected to the false moves. But um, so anyway, I, I, this is a great book of essays by some of the people that write the be very best stuff and smartest stuff on, on Marx and on capital and on value. Um, so here are, a, a, I have like one or two thoughts about this book and then one or two thoughts about the bigger picture again, um, that this book is connected to, but I feel like they are sort of marginal to this book, but I'll just bring them back in, and especially in insofar as you're thinking of this book as really being a pair with the other book, um, even if it's not front and forward all the time. So one question just about this book, a place where I might push, is that um, especially, you know, in this wonderful discussion of, of um, empty sociality uh, in the central chapters about um, about value. I, you know, there's not a lot of use of the word alienated. Um, and so, you know, my my thing is that I think val value is not just sociality, it's alienated sociality. Um, and that might pertain to Tony's question about how this analysis, fits or doesn't fit to market socialism or anywhere that you have a market, is it going to be alienated in the same way? But so, so I'm just curious, like, is it okay if we drop in alienated as an adjective, <laughs> alienated, empty, uh, so, um, sociality there? Uh, 
so that's one that point that's connected to the book. Another point that's connected, uh, you know, more to the content of, of this book is just basically to really, I think, agree with Tony and, um, and echo the um, points of interest around uh, white supremacy and patriarchy. And, um, you know, just to say, like, there's a really interesting exchange between um, Ellen, the late Ellen Wood and Adolph Reed Jr. about um, whether, you know, the relationship between these three structures of power. And I find Tony's thought is sort of intriguing that capitalism, if, a cap if capitalism essentially needs to divide the working class, then that might push you towards thinking that one or some kind of one or the other of these systems is somehow internal to the logic. Um, but I guess I just think like, I'd love to see you write a paper where you interact with, with Ellen's piece on this. I think it's chapter, it's either chapter seven or chapter nine in um, Democracy Against Capitalism. And it's a, it's a wonderful piece, uh, actually separate from the debate with, with uh, Adolf Reed Jr. Um, but so then the, the couple points that I wanted to make that sort of go back to the factoring philosophy framework. Um, the one is to say, I, you know, <laughs> thank you for sharing, but um, I guess that's my job. Um, I, I still have a reservation about, sort of curiosity and reservations about like, binaries and purism being the deepest problem like those are the ultimate bad guys i i mean i don't they probably are most most of the time bad guys but i don't know if they're always bad guys and similarly with subject and object and here i'm just cribbing directly from adorno on subject and object but i think it kind of makes the point is like Subject and object, it's true that they you, you, you're not going you can't hypothesize them, right? But subjects are objects in a very different way than objects bear the mark, or some objects <laughs> bear the mark of subjectivity. It's it's asymmetrical. And I think that's maybe another way to get at what I was saying last time. Like, I wonder if there's a certain kind of the world is just saturated with mind ontology driving this analysis, like subject and object. It's not just that they're like interrelated. And so it's like half and half or it's all mingled. They are interrelated. The subjects, when they're us and other material sentient, the subjects are all material sentient creatures. But the objects aren't sentient creatures. I mean, unless they're the sentient ones, <laughs> you know, but the other ones, they might, if they're insofar as they're capitalist commodities, they may be reifications of the sentience of the material the material subjects. It's but it's not just, it's asymmetrical. And so to me, that's just like an illustration of the what makes me nervous about is just like all binary is bad or pure is bad. So any pure, they're not bad in all in the same way. And I I guess my feeling, well, so that's a point. Um I, but related is that I wanna say like I'm curious that you guys use the, the concept and term phenomenology in places where I would have used ontology and sometimes in places where I would have used epistemology. But so there too, like there's some places where it's like, well, why are, why am I being told that the phenomenology is wrong? How come I'm not just being told that the ontology is wrong? Like you got the ontology wrong here. Um, and other places, I think people can get the epistemology wrong. And I think these things, 
And we don't, I can say that as somebody who believes that there's no free floating minds. <laughs> you know, I, I say that as an embodied subject who's an object. Um, but I think some of, again, some of the intricacies of it, like very often the epistemology is bad because the ontology is bad. But sometimes it can go the other way around, arguably, you know, if you're some kind of hardcore, like content epistem uh, empiricist, you're going to wind up a phenomenalist without ever, you don't have to start out being a phenomenalist if you agree with Hume about the, the epistemology. Um, but in any case, they're, they are interrelated. And so I find myself curious why why we uh, to me we have more we have the power to say more things in a more fine-grained or variegated way if we deploy the categories of epistemology and ontology with the presupp with it, what is in my view a correct ontology of ourselves as materially embodied thinking beings. But I like the, the, the category of phenomenology feels like it collapses those two. And again, that drives me back to, to what extent is an ontology in which there's less separation um, than I might want um, driving this analysis, right? Like, um, so those are my thoughts from the, but it's, you know, I'm going to be assigning, you know, I, <laughs> people out in U2 land, you know, I met these guys because I wrote a fan letter about the, the wonderful paper on abstract labor, you know, from 2003. And I was like, this is the best thing I've ever read. And I think this stuff, you know, this, it's, it's great. Like first order level stuff, it's just terrific. Okay, thanks very much, Ruth. Uh, very, very positive note at the end, but I'm sure we can rely on Tom to begin to stick the dagger back in. Tom, over to no, you. No, no daggers. <laughs> Although uh, uh, a couple of points that have uh, provoked our comrades uh, have also provoked me. Uh, I have probably seven comments uh, moving from Encomium to a couple of questions that have already been uh, in a certain way raised. Uh, but I was reflecting reading uh, this book uh, that Patrick and Jean had been uh, spending probably longer than 50 years studying the thought of Karl Marx. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, Bernard Lonergan talks about Thomas Aquinas and describes the 11 years he took to reach up to the mind of Aquinas. And I feel like Murray and Schuler have reached up to the mind of Karl Marx. So uh, there are some things that I admire about this. Three uh, that I would like to mention very briefly. Uh, first of all, the way that uh, Murray and Schuler integrate Marx into the mainstream canon of academic philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably say more about academic philosophy in the brief uh, time I have to comment. And within a university context, and specifically having to do with the foot soldier teaching ethics every semester probably fall into my grave teaching ethics and there's a lot of moral philosophy in this volume and uh marx becomes a kind of major figure in the canon of moral philosophy uh, by way of this book in terms of uh the conversations that uh Patrick and Jean stage not only with uh, Kant and Hegel, but also with utilitarianism and with uh, several figures in contemporary critical theory and Alistair McIntyre and, and so forth. Uh, so the first point was then uh, how much I appreciate 
the way Patrick and Gene have uh, situated and placed Marx as a philosopher uh, into the mainstream canon of philosophy, uh, which I think is, you know, welcome and long overdue and uh, probably not likely to be generalized anytime soon. Uh, second, uh, I would say that as scholars, uh, these scholars achieve a very high degree of, uh, and I'll say high fidelity uh, to the thinker uh, they're investigating. I think it's unusual, frankly, uh, what Paul Ricoeur might have called the hermeneutics of respect, uh, 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 just really, really maintaining uh, 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 a spirit of going the distance with Marx. And uh, both in the text that everyone reads and in obscure texts that nobody but the very uh, most dedicated Marx scholars would probably uh, immerse themselves in. So, so really, uh, this deep fidelity to the thought of Karl Marx is itself uh, extremely valuable, I think. But that would lead me then to my third and final point of encomium or high praise here, which would be to say that I think precisely because they've been so faithful, to uh, 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 the philosopher Karl Marx uh, over years and decades. Uh, there's an originality and a creativity here that that could only be plausible if it if it if if it was rooted in the in the deep study that Murray and Schuler have undertaken. And so examples have already been mentioned. I'll just mention three really quickly. And I'll mention them quickly because I need to end and we've got to get to discussion. And uh, some of these things have already been said. Uh, but the types of subsumption, uh, so reading, you know, the appendix to the folks uh, and uh, we learned about formal and real subsumption, uh, ideal and hybrid forms of subsumption. It seems to me that there's a certain degree of originality that Murray and Schuler achieved in their treatment of the forms of subsumption uh, that's really valuable. Secondly, uh, to think of the commodity spectrum, which they introduced in the first chapter, and then devote a later chapter, I believe it was a chapter eight, to the uh, uh, a commodity spectrum. And it seems to me, uh, although I'm in Spokane, Washington, so correct me if I'm wrong, I might as well be on the dark side of the moon, but from where I'm situated, it seems to me that this is highly original work. Uh, uh, and then finally, the shadow forms of capital. Uh, 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 that, that those three concepts uh, having to do with the types of subsumption, the commodity spectrum, and the shadow forms are... Uh, we were talking about jazz before we started, uh, in a way, riffs on the thought of Karl Marx uh, that, that that are packed with originality and creativity and that I don't think we're going to read about elsewhere, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that are in this particular book and uh, are, are quite complementary to this very deep rootedness in the thought itself. Uh, which I've called the hermeneutics of respect in its uh, most exemplary form, uh, probably. Now I said I had six points I want to make, so so let's keep these trains moving. The second then would just be to go to the pseudo concepts themselves. I don't think there's much need for me to elaborate here, but the economy, utility, and instrumental reason and action, I would say, as pseudo forms in the sense that uh, there's nothing for these, or rather pseudo concepts, I mean to say, there's nothing for these concepts to be concepts of. And, uh, you know, I started teaching, okay, so this is why I'm going to get inside the university a little bit, and the university's not the world. Uh, 
but there is a proletarianization of academic labor. And so, uh, you know, we proles, we groundlings, we foot soldiers trying to teach philosophy in the classroom. Oftentimes we end up teaching ethics, just grinding out ethics courses. And there's a kind of, uh, in catalogs and course catalogs at universities, uh, their utilitarianism kind of has to be taught. Now I've abandoned teaching it owing to Murray and Schuler, And so far I haven't gotten into trouble for that. Why would I want to teach my students who are not philosophy majors and are not going to pursue these matters outside my course? Why would I, why would I want to spend a third of my course on a pseudo concept? I, I can't answer that question anymore. Uh, 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 and, and and here's another, it's kind of a personal point. The second point that's kind of personal that has to do with the institutional arrangements of the modern university. Uh, Murray, Murray's, I used to think to myself, and, and, and Murray and Schuler say that he, economics is a pseudoscience. And I've just recently, I've been teaching the phenomenology of spirit to some graduate students. And uh, we were recently did some work on physiognomy and uh, phrenology, you know, and maybe we could, you know, append economics to that list, uh, 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 you know, phrenology and economics. And I'm going to major <laughs> in phrenology and I'm going to minor in economics now. And I believe that Murray and Schuler have been emboldened in their own campus community to acquire a kind of reputation for thinking of economics this way. And uh, I think it may have harmed them or not. Maybe they'd say something about it, but I can't imagine I'm teaching, you know, so I've been teaching Marxism since I was a little boy and I'm not saying, well, but I've been teaching it for a long time and I'm in the department of philosophy we have all these students in the School of Business Administration who are being propagandized into the illusion of the economic in just the way that Murray and Schuler want to write about that in both books, False Moves and here in Philosophical and Political Consequences. And I just, I mean, you know, I just, I don't see how an untenured assistant professor, let alone an adjunct or a lecturer, could occupy a philosophy classroom in order to announce to 30 or 50 students that economics is a pseudoscience. I think, I think that, you know, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to use a certain uh, vulgar metaphor for what I think that takes uh, to do that, you know, with gumption and tenacity and in a way that sticks. And so I just have to regard myself as a kind of coward I always say I have this friend in Omaha who thinks that economics is a pseudoscience. That's what I always that's what I always say in order to deflect responsibility away from myself uh, with respect to the economy, utility, instrumental reason, et cetera. Moving on to a third point, then uh, the, the critique of discourse ethics, which I've taught on uh, the graduate and even on the doctoral level. So you know. Uh, 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 if I may say so, I'm a student of James L. Marsh's, who in the period that I studied most closely with him, uh, could have been called the left Habermasian. And probably the first thing that I read by Habermas was Towards a Rational Society. And there's that long essay, he loves charts and tables, where he delineates the distinction between uh, purpose of rational action on the one hand and symbolic interaction on the other hand. And, you know, like I'm 20 years old and I'm trying to read Habermas and I don't understand a word of what I'm attempting to read. And uh, this distinction, you know, and then you go through all the permutations of Habermas getting to, you know, I mean, system and life world and then, and then up to discourse ethics itself where they're not so much writing about Habermas as they're writing about uh, Sh Shayla Ben-Habib, but they're taking discourse ethics to the map uh, in terms of, uh, I hate to say it now, 
But this demarcationist approach or a logic of demarcation that's going to link up, I think, to Ruth's last point about binaries and purist splits and factoring philosophy and so forth. Because here's another case of factoring philosophy where you have labor on the one hand and interaction on the other hand. And maybe this has more of a Schuler imprint than a Murray imprint because there's a redemption of Hegel's reputation. Take, taking this uh, uh, neo-Weberian or neo-Kantian, neo-Kantian and neo-Weberian conception of labor or work and then reading it back into uh, Hegel in particular. And uh, the, the, the effort here is to salvage uh, Hegel from that kind of misreading, uh, a Hegel legend, I think they call it. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, I just think that that is uh, 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 a very important contribution because there's much to admire about discourse ethics, in my modest opinion. Uh, and yet uh, uh, the project, as it's worked out by Habermas and uh, uh, by Ben Habib, depends upon factoring philosophy. And so ultimately it's going to be based on foundations of sand, and so, so there'd be a need for some kind of regrounding here. Uh, 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 let me move more quickly here. Fourth, well, that that put that phrase economics imperialism and the accompanying note, uh, which is you know links back to this other point about economics being a uh, pseudoscience. Uh, you know what? I'll be the third person to go to page forty-one. Uh, when I go to page one, I, I would like to add to uh, when they when they attribute on page forty one the difficulties of recognizing capital as a social form to uh, modern and postmodern anti essentialism and. Uh, and then link back to Aristotle, and then on, and then they give a, a sketch of the argument uh, on pages fifty-seven, fifty-eight, note two. So there's a footnote there. For me, it was really important to read the sketch of the argument, and uh, uh, I guess I do kind of want to be in a rush, but I care very much about this point. And there's another case where, if I may be a little bit excessively autobiographical. When I was doing philosophy, you know, trying to do philosophy in the 80s and 90s and into the aughts, if you wanted to uh, speak about the essence of something or the nature of something, you would be in effect boot. I mean, it was like an, a climate of intimidation. And again, I saw Murray talking about essence at some public talk he gave a long time ago. And I thought, gee whiz, I wish I could hold my head up high and look directly at a room full of uh, philosophers and talk about what something essentially is, you know, by virtue of its nature. So I, I think uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at this. The uh, 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 kind of really backlit, but nevertheless unmistakable presence of Aristotle or the spirit of Aristotelianism, which, of course, we know is important to Hegelian Marxism or ought to be kind of from the ground up. And uh, and again, if you know, if you had the right kind of respect for Aristotle, that then you might talk about the natures of things and you might talk about what their essences are. And you might even work out a theory of social form. Uh, uh, with respect to this question of what makes capital hard to recognize, and uh, in particular, postmodern thought with its anti foundationalism and its anti essentialism, and the way that anti foundationalism and anti essentialism have been appropriated by a liberal left or a, a progressive politics, uh, and people like Richard Rorty and so forth, and you're ending up in liberal irony and so forth. 
made it really hard to do philosophy in those years. And so I'm a little bit uh, happy that uh, the sun seems to have set on a certain kind of postmodern thought by 2024, which makes, I think, Murray and Schuler even more readable than ever. Uh, I had time. Do I have time for two more real quick? One is uh, six, I guess, six, a question. Page 88, uh, they, uh, uh, Murray and Schuler in this uh, essay on Marx, subjectivism and modern moral philosophy, note a number of counter tendencies to the nihilism of commerce. And by the way, a few pages later, they call Kant a nihilist. And again, I'm not going to be walking up and down the hallway of my uh, office building. We have a whole Robinson house. We have the place is crawling with philosophers, each of us individually coherent, the committee of the whole completely incoherent. And I'm not about to wander the halls saying Kant is a nihilist. I'll say Murray and Schuler, these <laughs> people in Omaha, called Kant a nihilist. Again, as, as the upshot of a factoring philosophy and uh, a pure split. But, and we could talk about that as kind of the nihilist or whatever that might mean after calling utilitarians nihilists. Very interesting. So, why are we teaching ethics and then disseminating? You know, in the, you're supposed to be doing virtue ethics, utilitarianism, and deontology. And those are the big three. And if you're trying to get tenure or you want to be reappointed for the next year, then this is the kind of stuff you have to teach in your ethics classroom. And, uh, you know, just between us chickens, it's a load of swill uh, uh, on false foundations. Uh, but I wanted to get to these counter tendencies and they list them by number. And there are seven of them all together on pages 88 and 89. And one of them that's really striking is uh, the first, capitalism recognizes a realm of the sacred, they write, colon, not everything does have a price. Buyers and sellers are recognized as persons and persons are not for sale. And then across the page on 89, Persons are not commodities to be bought and sold. This is a fundamental premise of capitalism. And it's, I do not, uh, I don't think, I, I'm in no position to disagree with the point. So it's not exactly that I disagree with the point, but if a person were to say, uh, what's wrong with capitalism? Uh, it seems to me that, especially if you're reading Marx against the backdrop of economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. In other words, the humanist Marx, you're going to say that what is uh, one of the things that's more deeply and profoundly wrong with capitalism uh, uh, is its tendency to dehumanize us. And uh, precisely because it is an impersonal abstract uh, 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 form of domination. And so one could go to the Bible, which is volume one of Capital, and find many uh, biblical texts. Uh, but I, I wanted the text from uh, the general law of capitalist accumulation on uh, uh, 799. Uh, and we all know this passage uh, uh, well enough. Uh, 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 about the despotism that, uh, 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 you, you know, the page, it's going to more firmly than Hephaestus is nailed to his rock here about, uh, 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 it follows therefore that in proportion as capital accumulates the situation of the worker, be his payment high or low must grow worse. Uh, turning his labor into a torment, alienating him from the intellectual potentialities. It's, it, you know, the page, so I don't need to read the whole page. And in fact, that's one page there. If you went looking for passages like this in volume one of Capital, 
you'd have a nice thick booklet full of uh, pages uh, ad- where Marx is addressing himself to the way in which capital dehumanizes us, degrades our humanity, treats us more like commodities than it treats us like persons. So uh, on pages 88 and 89, Murray and Schuler are saying something different than this, which also I think is probably related to the issue about egalitarianism and uh, uh, fundamental human equality and so forth. So, And it's not as if I'm going to say that the point they're making is wrong. I wouldn't dream of saying that, but that it seems to be in a kind of tension with this other point about the dehumanizing uh, 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 effects of capitalist production and circulation. Last comments already been made by both uh, Tony in one way, I believe Ruth in another, concerning this critique of Nancy Fraser and then uh, Patrick's letter from 1995, which is almost 30 years ago, to Judith Butler, and I wonder if she ever replied, uh, in which he uh, 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 writes that line in conclusion that uh, Tony's already quoted. Uh, and so, and so, I very quickly then looked up because I wondered if there was a writer named Tony Smith who has a chapter of the uh, uh, my delay here, uh, systematic and historic historical dialectics towards a Marxian theory of globalization, and so he distinguishes Smith does between three types of dialectic: historical systematic and the dialectic of theory and practice. And uh, I've known about this distinction again for years and years. And uh, I sometimes wondered whether Murray and Schuler were saying these things about homophobia and racism and uh, what am I leaving out here? Just gender, I guess. Uh, uh, what Ryan Dionysus guy calls the man-woman relation, uh, uh, and of course we're thinking about gender in entirely different ways now. That that the capital's more or less indifferent uh, to uh, whether women work or don't work, and uh, whether they're you know what marriage equality. What does capitalism care about marriage equality? And and I I mean I can kind of we've been having this argument for a long time, and I have a I have an essay called uh, 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 Marx Capitalism and Race, and and what I I thought my answer would be to distinguish between historical dialectics and systematic dialectics following Tony Smith, because because especially African slavery is so integral to the genesis of capitalist social relations. You don't have capitalism without the triangular trade. So uh, uh, you have to have uh, the middle passage. You have to have cotton plantations in the Southern US. You have to have the export uh, back to England uh, 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 in order to have capitalism, it seems to me. And it seems to me that Marx says this in a lot of places, in a lot of texts. And so I just can't shake loose uh, from the idea that anti-Black racism in particular is a structural feature of capitalist production and circulation uh, right down to the present day. I, I, I don't know if it's it's a it's it's constitutive of the social form of capital. Uh, so that is a question, and so I'll just end with a question mark. But needless to say, I am a huge Murray and Schuler fan. I love the occasion to read both of these books. I'm so happy they're in print, and uh, I just think everyone should read them. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, so we've had the Murray and Shula fan club. Let's <laughs> see if Murray and Shula want to make some responses before we go on to the questions. 
I, I had a thought about Ruth, the um, the uh, neglect of the ontological, and I guess I I, I uh, do uh, think that human existence is a you know the species being so to speak is really important and privileged and you and it has its own distinctive features that are not shared by other animal species. Um, I guess why I see phenomenology as kind of privileged is because I see it as how we encounter X, you know, taking stock of how we encounter X, the phenomenological features of the knower in the world at this time in history, that phenomenology is sort of reminding us of those prerequisites for asking a question. This is right out of Heidegger, you know? So to ask what is ontology, I'm asking it from a phenomenological point standpoint as a human being, which is why the distinctive species being of humans, I, I think is riding on a phenomenological kind of clarity about what it is to ask a question. It, 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 uh, uh, and, and I do, and um, so in my mind, that's the, the uh, separation. Um, that um, that asking about ontology presupposes language, presupposes a community, presupposes meaning, presupposes everything that phenomenology is trying to take it, uh, hold of, and then asking the ontological question. Maybe that's maybe you have a different sort of presupposition of ontology, um, <clears throat> but. Um, it occurs to me, uh, you know, Being in Time is a kind of important book for us and maybe more than the other book. But, you know, I mean, Being in Time is the, the part that we use, the first 200 pages, the existential analytic of Dasein. It's an ontology that's done phenomenologically, right? So the method is, so he's doing ontology, but how? Uh, through, through phenomenology. And uh, but I, I it's a really good it's a really good question right. and right. we need to think more about it right for example to talk about um, capital as a subject it's really important that capital as a subject is used in a sense metaphorically capital is not human capital has some of these similarities to sort of a you know self determining reality that other that the rest of the world reacts to, but it's not, <laughs> it's not human. <laughs> um, uh, in my, as I understand this, this super subject. Um, yeah, uh, just, just to pick up on, on that, uh, Tony, about, uh, you know, capital as a subject, you know, we have a, this kind of phrase, race, class, and gender kind of trips off the, the, the tongue in progressive, pro, uh, progressive circuits. Well, uh, yeah, that leaves out another word, capital, right? So uh, what Marx says about uh, class is, uh, where'd it go? Mm, just pull that up. Yeah, so in the Grundriss, he says classes are an empty phrase if I'm not familiar with the elements on which they rest. So, and of course, in a capitalist society, <laughs> the leading element would be would be capital itself. So, I I think maybe bringing that that in um, as a as yeah, I mean to see capital as, as as a problem. But of course, if you don't have the something like the Marxian conception of capital, well then. You know, if you've got Paul Samuelson's view or the mainstream view that it's just some sort of resource, well, of course, it doesn't belong in that list. You, you can't put it in that list. You can only put it in the list when you, you have a critical idea of it. And, and that this goes also, I, I would be inclined to uh, uh, the points you're making about market society, market socialism. I, I'm inclined to agree with you uh, on that, uh, that you don't you don't um, eliminate capital that you could have. Uh, I, I think it's a long time ago, people were talking about like pension fund capitalism. Like what if all the capital was in pension funds and owned by workers who put them into pension funds? Would we, 
you know, I think we still have the force. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'm sort of, I, for myself, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. Uh, well, agree then I, I have approach. a question for that, for, for you too. So, so that, are you assuming that any production will be production of surplus value that has to be validated through market circulation? Could you not have production, not production of commodities, or goods that are whose value is based on expropriating a surplus from the producers that has to be then validated. And that's just what you're saying, then, huh? There's no other mode of production than the production of goods based on socially necessary abstract labor. Because I, I would I mean, think we, valid markets could be ways of distributing goods where validation of the surplus isn't the goal. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with you, Jean. I mean, I, I'm just wondering why. It, uh... Anyway, keep going. Yeah, okay. Um, I, uh, to, to Tony, uh, all, all of these comments, there's really so much to respond to uh, and think about. I, I really like the idea of uh, you know the whole the the political and the idea of uh, thinking about real subsumption in the politic in the political yeah. sphere uh, and what that would look what what that would look like. I mean, one of the things that we talked some about universities here, but you know, a lot of public universities that are not for profit, they're you know state run things, and I, I think. You know, you can see a lot of, and uh, Tony, I think you mentioned this sort of as part of that comment. This is what I I would call, and I think you use this phrase too in Beyond uh, Liberal Egalitarianism about real subsumption without formal sum subsumption. So there's a lot of talk. We read a whole book on the corporatization of the university. Well, what corporatization, I mean, the oldest corporation in the United States is Harvard University, I believe. So the corporate, I mean, just like the corporate form is a legal form. That's not what you're talking about. Corporatization means real subsumption. It means you're imitating uh, capitalist firms uh, insofar as their real subsumption is going on there. And, and that uh, not-for-profit firms and state firms are adopting uh, these ways of uh, capitalist firms that have undergone real, real subsumption in various ways. So I think that's certainly part of it, but, but the very, I mean, that maybe what goes deeper would be the very political forms. How would, you know, what would it, what would it mean to think about real subsumption there? And, and, and as you're doing, you know, thinking about real subsumption there in close connection with, you know, with the, capitalist where you have formal sub, formally subsumed capitalist firms and as you were putting it and as responsive to maybe the difficulties you know um i mean that you you mentioned financialization also but i mean i, I think what 40 40 per, plus percent of profit of surplus value is is coming to financial firms one way or the other so that's that's a huge thing and then you talked about the role of the of the state. Uh, that's the first time I heard that expression, uh, collateral factory. So I'll have to track that down. But uh, that, no, that's all very provocative and, and um, you know, opens, uh, Tom, you were talking about originality and opening, opening things up. I think there's a lot of room for some original work to be done there. Just one thing, Gene uh, wants to say something, but uh, just one thing on your first point, Tom, about you know, bringing Marx into the canon. I'm happy to happy to hear that. In fact, some I've always, for years, as we've worked on these books, especially uh, False Moves, I've had the, the subtitle never intended really as a subtitle, but uh, philosophy as if Hegel and Marx existed. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that's been on my mind for a long time. So uh, yeah, if it could be, you know, both. Hegel and, and Marx could be really brought in. I mean, there have been sorts of revivals of Hegel and Marx and literature and new translations, yeah. etc. But I don't think they really 
uh, are taking hold that much, that, that much, you know, I mean, I'm, if you picked up a contemporary book in the history of political economy, which I haven't done, but I, I just bet if you pick it up, Marx will be a Ricardian. Yeah. A or a minor post Ricardian, as as was said, right? I don't think I, I don't think the whole, you know, really to me, the sea change away from reading Marx as a kind of left Ricardian to reading him as he is, a theorist of social forms. Uh, you know, there's a lot of literature out there, but I don't think it's really uh gotten into a lot of the mainstream. Of course, it can't get into the mainstream of economics. That's, uh, that's for sure. Uh, we, won't, we won't hold our breath for, for that. I just kind of wonder if you um, folks think that the capture of the state for purposes of um, ideal subsumption um, uh, is runs into kind of the the possibility of more um, uh, making making public the ways of capital um, that when the state gets harnessed to um, ensure profits for powerful economic forces is it is it harder to hide the, the capture of the system. And it, 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 it'll have kind of like a, is Habermas maybe a legitimation crisis or something that gets raised. Um, uh. let, let, let me say something to this, uh, this kind of hot button issue about, uh, you know, page, page uh, what, 56 and seven and, and that. And uh, I, I would point out what, I mean, so the letter to Judith Butler uh, which really followed upon uh, the recognizing capital uh, essay that Gene and I wrote wrote together, and involves a kind of criticism of of an article by Nancy Fraser, a kind of famous article on uh, redistribution and recognition. But that was the year 1995. I think it's actually the beginning of 1996 that the Democratic president. Bill Clinton signed the Marriage Defense Act. Uh, the Marriage Defense Act was uh, an act of Congress declaring that marriage was uh, between a man and a woman. And uh, so the idea that homophobia was, I took Butler's talk to be saying homophobia is really integral to capitalism. When the Supreme Court of the United States uh, endorses same-sex marriage uh, as a constitutional right. I, I'm not. I, I. I don't think the Supreme Court is really going to go against things that are <laughs> integral to capitalism. That's just. That's just a, a working hypothesis of mine. Uh, so. I. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I. I would read. I would read uh, two. Two th things. Uh, one is why do these keep going away from it? One, one is this from the from the results of the immediate production process, where he says that the, the formal subsumption of labor under capital dissolves the relationship between the owners of the conditions of labor and the workers into a relationship of sale and purchase, a purely financial relationship. In consequence, the, the process of exploitation is stripped of every, of every patriarchal, political, or even religious cloak. That's pretty strong, isn't it? So, I mean, a quote like that almost makes me think like maybe the question should be divided between how we should represent Marx and then maybe, maybe uh, Marx should be criticized. I mean, the thing I've always wondered about is if, if you know, if racism, patriarchy, homophobia, if these things are integral to capitalism a, as a social form, well then, um, yeah, there's something really wrong with uh, the book Capital. Because they're not, I don't, I don't think they're there as integral. Um, 
Now, I also think, though, uh, some, I'll read one passage from on the Jewish question that I, that's always struck me. And uh, this goes back to when he's talking about political emancipation, the, the critique of Bruno Bauer and that. And Marx writes, the state abolishes distinctions of birth, rank, education, and occupation in its fashion when it declares them to be non-political distinctions. When it proclaims that every member of the community equally participates in popular sovereignty with regard, out regard to distinctions. Nevertheless, okay, so I, 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 then he says, nevertheless, the state permits private property, education, and occupation to act and manifest their particular nature as private property, education, and occupation in their own ways. So what that says to me is that you can you you can kind of cancel these 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 discriminations. I mean, I think of just the mainstream, you know, the mainstream civil rights movement in the United States, which more or less, I would say, accomplished the legal agenda by 1968 with the with the uh, open housing law. I mean, you can do this, and and it seems to me that's exactly what Marx was talking about with political emancipation. Say, no, no, everybody's equal, and so forth. And yet, all the inequalities that are already in place will will just keep oper will just keep operating, so that you don't really get uh, other forms of, of of equality that. That you would be hoping for. I I I, uh, I think that idea of the maybe an essential social form of capital is um, the uh, recognition of the other to drive um, to drive down wages and to maintain um, sort of dividedness among the labor force. I I think that's. A, you know, often pretty effective as a way of uh, social management of a capitalist society to to uh, redirect uh, discontent, targeting groups as uh, uh, you know public enemy like immigrants and asylum seekers right now. Mm. Public enemy when, as a matter of fact, immigrants and asylum seekers are at the core of the growth of the economy right now. But, but they're being used to manage the discontent that might actually raise other questions. So to me, that seems like how hit the, either the historical dialectics, what you were saying, Tom, like how racism is at the core of our capitalist history in, in the United States and continues to be central. Um, the difference between that... Uh, um, importance of dividing labor and the pure forms of capitalism, the essence or etc. Uh, I don't know if that's, you know, <laughs> if it's like at the very foundation or you can never have this actually existing kind of society unless you divide the population because um, otherwise um, it's, it's, it's not going to work. Um, it, you know. I, I, I'd be open to that suggestion of a systematic tendency. I mean, you'd have to, to think about it and maybe even, you know, Tony, you mentioned the missing books of capital and wage labor book. I could imagine, you know, if it, it, it being there, uh, it's po possible, but I, I, you know, uh, so I, I, I'd be open to that. Ruth of, uh, alienation. Sure. Yeah, uh, I I don't know. You know, uh, you know, if you think about the things that uh, Marx was talking about back in 1844 under alienation, they're all in place in in capital. I mean, uh, so yeah, uh, I'd be uh, be for that. Tom, you know, uh, the I was juxt as you were speaking later on uh, about and, and reading from. Page 799, I guess it was, uh, that, you know, the harsh things and juxtaposing against the person. But, I mean, who, if you think of somebody in the history of philosophy for whom the person is such a vital and, 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 and 
key category, I would think of Immanuel Kant, who a few minutes earlier, you were quoting us as, as, as regarding as a nihilist. Uh, so, uh, so why is that, right? So the problem is like the person, and this is, this is really one, going back to the False Moves book, the idea of the, the kind of the featureless self, as Donald Davidson calls it, or the unencumbered selves, Sandel, the infinite self, Kierkegaard, I mean, this, that, that kind of self is, it, that's more the kind of self or the sense of the person, I think, that these, that the forms of, uh, you know, the buyer and seller uh, roles and the forms that characterize commodity and money ex exchanges are there. And uh, that's, you know, uh, fine, you're an equal person in come to the market. But uh, what if you don't, what if you don't have that, that money, Gene was talking about that, I mean, in, in this work, what if you don't have the money? What is those forms don't say don't, there's nothing in the forms of equality that say, Oh, you don't have any money. Oh, I'll go get you, uh, you know, a, a place to live in and, and clothes and health care. No. So what kind of, you know, so in other words, that the person in one sense is a high minded concept, I think. <clears throat> but if you're really talking about persons, I think in this very abstract way, yeah, it allows for a lot of what we would regard as neglect and, and mis, mistreatment. And I, 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 I... I have to think about the the um, questioning of bifurcation, um, and just to make it clear that the questioning of bifurcation and purism is not questioning difference and essential differences, but it's the form that difference takes when it is mm. posed as in terms of the purely, because uh, it to me it strips the subject of the world, the purely subjective strips the subject of the world and of relationships. It becomes, you know, atomism, and I don't think there is a subject in under those conditions. So um, I, I, I think I, I, when I look at uh, the emptiness, I think there's the actual emptiness and the actual nihilism of living in a world where this kind of looking continually for something else to squeeze, <laughs> squeeze out, squeeze out, squeeze out, you know, which. It's pretty, you know, as we go up into the, you know, the heavens, I, there's almost a, a question of there, if, there, if you actually reach a limit of nothing more to squeeze out, what will happen? Um, that to me, that emptiness is very real and takes a toll on uh, all of us. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a felt reality. You don't need concepts to access it. You just have to live in the world. But the emptiness of concepts like utility and efficiency, when it or just like general concepts like labor, as if it was telling you something. That's the emptiness that I think we're trying to address because that's the emptiness I think that many people just live with on a daily basis. Thinking doesn't make any difference because it doesn't make any difference if you're using those kinds of concepts. It simply is like white noise. You just use them in order to try and, you know, just live in this world and, and, and think that you've labeled something, but you haven't really understood anything. And that's the emptiness I think that we can do something about. And I think that's the emptiness that actually goes along with you know, I don't know if it's democratic socialism or organizing or sort of like social movements where powerful, more powerful ways of disclosing the deeply um, flawed mode of, of living on this planet can be more generally discussed and recognized. And, you know, what what are po po possible solutions? That's to me. Um, what as teachers, Tom, like in the classroom, and I never would go into a classroom and say economics is a pseudoscience either, because I just, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't really believe in the, the, you know, 
a philosophy by assault on on other on other human beings and their beliefs. I feel like critiques of utility yeah. really are over the long run. I think pretty uh, um, destabilizing of a lot of theories if you just kind of keep keep at it. Anyway, you guys might have comments. Yeah, it looks like we got some. Paul, what do you want to? Okay, let's let's move forward. Uh, we are running about one and three quarter hours now, but I've no intention of ending this until your three interlocutors have had an opportunity to speak and you have an opportunity to further respond. But there are two sets of questions. The first one, Lorenzo Doria, who thanks you for a very interesting presentation, very interesting discussion. With subsumption, would it make sense to add yet another typology, subsumption of knowledge production? And secondly, I, I'm going to abuse the chair and make a couple of comments which might be quite provocative. Uh, for me, your, the sum of your two books, uh, in a sense, has a real engagement with the issue of what philosophy is in relation to Marxism, from Marx through to Lenin, through to Korsh, through to Althusser, and more recently, Ullman and then Ben Said. And actually, the dissolving of the notion of philosophy as an abstractive form. Now, I'm not necessarily sure I wouldn't go further than you and say that philosophy is always an abstractive form and we need to concretize it. And I think in that respect, I when, when Tom was talking about the, the part of the book where you talk about persons, I would say that people are always already and everywhere commodities. And I refer back to Chris Arthur's work around subject-object, where the subject is always objectified. And the object is always given subjective properties. And that is the key to capitalism. That's the basis of alienation, as well as exploitation, as well as surplus extraction. That we make commodities living and we degrade humanity to commodity. I also think in relation to identities and particularly sexuality, which I know something about, I would be very careful about not including case studies from, for example, the Global South, where there have been very different formulations in the development of modern capitalism around race and sexuality. I do think they are concretized within capitalism's relationships. I don't think they can be taken away from that. I am a harsh critic in some ways of intersectionality and identity politics, but I think the sum of those oppressions, exploitations and alienations are precisely embodied in what I think is a key strength of your book, which is the phenomenological emphasis. I would probably disagree with Ruth in relation to the point about ontology, because I think what phenomenology does as a philosophy when Marxism take it on is embodied. But I do think that one of the things you might emphasize more in your critique is the methodological, is the notion that the real problem here is that philosophy and to an extent feminist, anti-racist, homophobic and disabledist critiques do is to work at a level of abstraction, which doesn't see the concrete notion of that subject of the dialectic and that notion of concretization. And in that sense, while I, I agree with Tom and many of the points he made, I think when we talk about subsumption and when we talk about concepts, we should also talk about not that they are a different level, but they are mediations within that level of abstractiveness, which has dominated knowledge. And therefore, philosophy as a discipline has dominated a sense of knowledge. And what Marxists do is say, well, philosophy is in a way a sense of engaging in serious issues from, from the fragments of Aristotle through to Kant but they essentially abstract rather than concretize. And the great, for me, the great achievement of Marxism is that it brings it back to the concrete and therefore the inevitability of that subject-object relationship, that dialectic which concretizes and embodies 
and makes things subjective and subjects things. Sorry, a brief rant there on my part, but I think maybe let's let uh, Tony, Tom and Ruth make some comments and then we'll let Patrick and Jean engage for the final time. So I suppose Tony. Well, just to pick up on this thing about the concrete uh, versus the abstract. I mean, I think one of the strengths of the book, I mean, this, this idea of the illusion of the economic is really a, 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 a nice way to talk about concrete common sense, right? So there are lots of reasons why we don't have socialism, <laughs> a lot of reasons. Uh, but among the list of reasons why we don't have it is because of how we interpret concrete life. And because of these shadow forms like utility and like wealthism and like productivism, most people think it's just common sense that a market society is the most efficient way to produce the things that can help us meet our needs. And if our needs aren't being met, the problem's not with the market society, because the market society, you know, it's all about just producing the things that we need to meet our to meet what's useful for us. Um, and and so that and so if you if you if if that's how what common sense is, then you're already ninety percent of the way to, you know, at, at best some social democratic reformism, where if we just had different policies, then we could use this incredible productive machinery, wealth producing machinery of a of a capitalist market society, and and just and then it would be able to serve our needs and human ends and the human good and all that. And so, you know, the most concrete level presupposes you've got all these abstract views about what's going on in the world, <laughs> right? And, and it's the illusion of the economic in those terms, right? And, and uh, so, I, you know, the only point I'm trying to make here is that if we want to get to the concrete, it, it not only requires, <laughs> you know, all the organizational questions the left doesn't have a good answer to, all the leadership questions the left doesn't have a good answer to, all the strategic and tactical questions that we don't have good answers to, but it does require also above and beyond all that, a transformation of common sense, like like Gramsci and others talked about. And what, what these books do is a tremendous contribution to that part of the struggle. <laughs> uh, and that's not the whole thing, <laughs> but it does seem to be an absolutely essential part of the thing. Mm -hmm. So I just, I guess would just like to end on that. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a necessary thing that has to be done and it seems very hopeless, right? To break through these shadow forms make capital invisible, right? And they, they are so incredibly effective at making capital invisible. And we can't get a, a post-capitalist project going, you know, we can't get to stage one of it <laughs> unless we can make capital invisible, uh, visible, right? So that we know why we want to get to a post-capitalist phase. And so any book like these books that can, uh, you know, break down these, the common sense that that is just based on illusion uh, is worth doing. I mean, it, just one last point, you know, the Constitution of the United States, right? Uh, this, this, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all all men are created equal with life, liberty, and the right to pursuit of happiness. Uh, you know, that's a list of the shadow forms of capital, <laughs> right? Our, our our whole constitutional legal order is literally based on shadows of capital, uh, and unless we get that idea across to people, then the thought of just some you know some more radical transformation than playing around in the margins of public policy. Uh, isn't going to work. And again, I think these books are a great contribution to that. Well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm next then. Yeah, I really, I agree with that, Tony. I, I a, a couple of points I'd want to um, interject some, some of them little and, um, but I think, you know, what, what, just following from what Tony's just said, what we're talking about here, we've mostly been using this phrase shadow forms and whatever. I mean, we're talking about ideology and philosophy as ideology critique. And I, I do think that that's really an important role for philosophy. I think I said it last time and I say it again. I think there's maybe too quick of a tendency of, of amongst some 
Marx readers, you know, to be like, no, the instead of doing philosophy, we should be doing political analysis. And I think there's absolutely a role for both, but there's objective conditions and you have to be able to analyze them. And there's subjective conditions and you have to be able to be clear about them and to untangle them when they are, um, you know, when they're functioning to obscure the objective conditions. And I think that's a role um, for for philosophy, and it involves engagement with abstractions to be able to, to do that. Um, I just wanted to um, throw in a wonderful phrase that Himani Banerjee has in an old, wonderful collection of hers called In the Matter of X. And it's actually in that article, she talks about the concept of woman being simultaneously empty but full. And I think it would be interesting to make a distinction between concepts that are kind of uh, whatever that it, it, medical um, expression is, you know, where it's an artifact of, of bad machinery, like we might think, like McIntyre thinks rights are, you know, and concepts that are simultaneously empty but full, like efficiency um, or even instrumental reason, where it's like it's empty, but actually it's cover for something that really does have content. Um, and so like in the woman case, it's got content. Who is it? It's a white woman for sure. And probably one who's got some money and is located in a certain position. So it's not, it's, it's empty, but it's also full. So I think there are some that are empty, but full, and there's others that really are just artifacts of machinery. Um, the other, I, just a couple quick little other things. If you if you don't want, if you want to add on to the list of people to blame about saying economics isn't real, my my friend Tony Lawson teaches, you know, modeling at Cambridge, and and he's always saying economics is totally fake, <laughs> completely. Fake. So we can we can add him. He's a real economist. He's a modeler who thinks modeling is crazy and. <laughs> is not afraid to say so. Um, although there too, I think, again, this, the, um, the kind of the reification of the economic as a category, I mean, all of that, it's not just a mistake. It's an, it, it's, it's one of these empty but full mistakes that, that is, you know, is, is really important. I really wanted to um, thank Tony for bringing up the issue of the role of the state I, I, I teach this seminar on capital, but I also teach a seminar on the capitalist theories of the capitalist state. And, you know, it's only the Marxists who think about the capitalist state. Um, and, you know, there haven't been all that many of them recently, <laughs> but the heyday of thinking of Marxists thinking about the capitalist state um, wasn't yesterday. Um, but the material is wonderful. And I think like one really big question, Tony raised it in an, this great way about, well, do we need another kind of form of subsumption, political subsumption? And it, it seems to me like, you know, there's one, one kind of move to just insist that the state has a social form, right? And the, it's the capitalist state. It, it, so that's like a Miliband move paradigmatically, right? To say pluralism would be what you guys would be calling the the false move factoring thing. And like, no, this state has an imprint. But then there's the question about, like Tony was talking about, well, what is it actually doing in order to be like integral to the production of value? So some of the more value derivative theories of the state are like focused on that. But so I think there's a bunch of important and big distinctions to be made between in what sense is the capitalist state a capitalist state? And then what are the tasks that it has to do? And also to get to Jean's point about like, is it more obvious that it's a capitalist state when it does certain kind of things rather than other things? Um, I, I think probably yes and no, right? If you can get people to believe that what's good for General Motors is good for America, then the then the state can prop up <laughs> General Motors, and you know, and then again, that's just Miliband, a Miliband point. But um, but I think there's 
the these questions about the role of the state and how it, it articulates with capital um, and capitalism understood in such a rich, helpful way. Um, it's, you know, I would love if you, you guys would all get together and, <laughs> you know, write a, write a book on, on the state. Um, and I guess just one teeny little last point I wanted to make was that, uh, you know, this ways that the capitalism just saturates everywhere, you know, it's, it's so pernicious. I mean, even in the most abstruse metaphysics that on the one hand, you want to argue like I did last week, like, hey, it matters if parts and holes, if holes are bigger than parts, like that, you know, that's important. That's got polit real political content. But like the analytic metaphysicians from lock on, right, they, they love not just things that could be anything, but like now properties that could be any any other property in some other possible world. And if you ask yourself, like, what in the real world is like that? What What is actually the only thing that's like that is a capitalist commodity, right? It's a widget. That's right. It, it doesn't matter what it is. And it's like that kind of thinking, that kind of anti-essentialist thinking saturates the discipline um, and and is recognizably like when you say like, well, wait, what? <laughs> There's nothing like that. And you're like, oh, wait, there is a thing like that where it absolutely doesn't matter what it is. And it could be anything and still be it, <laughs> you know, but the thing that it is, is a capitalist commodity um, functioning as commodity capital, as Patrick said. So anyway, um, those are thoughts. I, it, it's a really good book. <laughs> Tony, sorry, Tom. It's a really good book. <laughs> I, I'm always tempted to say what they said, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, that this is a real sidebar, uh, uh, and I don't know that we want to tread down this path at all. Uh, but uh, Paul, before we started, mentioned how hard he's working, and he said he was a regular Spikanovite, and. Uh, so I started thinking about, uh, you know, the work that Raya Dunayevskaya was doing in the 1940s to establish uh, that the Soviet Union was, in fact, not a socialist, but a capitalist society, which she called state capitalism. And uh, so there's the Marxist humanist theory of state capitalism and uh beginning with the five-year plans, you know, when the goals are collectivization of agriculture and uh, rapid industrialization. Uh, in terms of those social goals, uh, you know, wherever the law of value prevails, there you'll find capitalism. And uh, Stalin, so by the time he's writing basic problems of Marxism, is saying that the law of value is operative in the Soviet economy. And the difference between uh, a, a centrally planned economy and the West is the difference between anarchic production and production that's organized by the state or a blind operation of the law of value as opposed to a, a planned and conscious operation of the law of value. Uh, so I don't know whether uh, anybody's talking about uh, the Marxist humanist theory of state capitalism these days. I just thought I'd put that out there more topically. And uh, uh, well, Tony was talking about common sense and what people take uh, to be the common sense. And uh, one of the things I learned from Murray and Schuler a long time ago was the critique of Karl uh, Polanyi's book about a disembedded economy. Uh, and then and then you mentioned Michael Sandel's unencumbered self and Donald Davidson's featureless self. And uh, seems to me that these tropes uh, could be organized under this heading of disenchantment, by the way. Whereas, uh, does that make sense to you folks? It makes sense to me. Whereas it seems to me that we do live in an enchanted society. I mean, so social form and purpose, you know, 
So in these other characterizations, uh, abstracted from or bereft of social form and bereft of determinate purpose, whereas in fact, that isn't capitalist reality at all. It's a mad, it's a mad purpose. I'm thinking of those uh, final lines of chapter four in volume one of Capital, which we all adore, uh, 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 about the mad chase after value. And it seems so much that that is inbred in our uh, 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 blood and bones. So I don't want to be talking about poisoning the blood in this particular context at all. Uh, but there's a kind of... Uh, 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 the very notion that we live in a disenchanted society seems to belong to the common sense of the age, whereas in fact, uh, good common sense would recognize uh, the enchantments of uh, of these false prom. I mean, all you got. Well, I I'm a kind of an MSNBC junkie. I suppose I shouldn't even say that. Uh, <laughs> So there's commercial advertising, and uh, the, and and the commercials are replete with this illusion of bourgeois p prosperity. Everybody's wealthy. Everybody drives a Lexus. Nobody really suffers from uh, any kind of want or anything like that. And it's this kind of allure, this kind of false promise that does seem to me to be. I have an essay a long time ago called. Uh, the secular religion, uh, post-secularism, and Marxism. And it seems to me that there is a kind, capital is a kind of secular religion or surrogate for religion. And that, so Patrick and Jean dog this notion that we live under conditions of disenchantment. And they say, to the contrary, and I would like to say, Amen to that as my last word here, I guess. Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Okay, Patrick, Jean, the Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you. Thank you all for the, those. I, I'm i very struck by that uh, little uh, venture into analytic metaphysics and the idea of anything. But I always, I, I, I like, uh, at one point, the United States Steel Company changed their name to USX. And I thought, like, that's just perfect. Thank you, for, thank you very much for advertising your absolute indifference to how you make money. Uh, and, and Patrick, I don't know if it was at that time, but I, at one point, Ford said it. But the the then CEO of I don't know if it was then of at one point a CEO of U.S. Steel said exactly that we're not in the business to make steel we're in the business to make money yeah yeah no but it, it just sort of put it changing that name just sort of like you know rubs our nose noses in it i think but i i want to the 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 point about the metaphysics i want to go back to paul's uh point about philosophy and it seems to me i want to i think there's two things one of course was the main thrust of, of uh, our last session with with factoring philosophy that uh so for us, uh, what number one, philosophy has to stop fa being factoring philosophy. So that's that that's uh, and that and that would reverberate in in a lot of ways. And uh, again, the the idea of losing public purpose uh, as due to ph factoring philosophy could be, I think, turned around or you know, the turned the ship around on that. But but the, today we're talking a, a lot about the critique of political economy as the Marxist critique of political economy is a critique of factoring philosophy. And, but Marx makes philosophy a lot more difficult, okay? I mean, I've, I've wondered sometimes whether he just gets rid of philosophy or he really makes it more difficult. I'm inclined to say makes it more difficult. Why? Because uh, the, the whole theme of historic, I mean, the, 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 the kernel of historical materialism the, that you have a mode of production that is also a, a mode of life or a way of life, including <laughs> including philosophy and really, really everything, means that if you really want to do philosophy, you 
you want to start you have to ground yourself in a in a pretty good knowledge of what the going mode of production is so that you could make a comment like yours Ruth right so you can't make that comment about about this analytic meta metaphysics without that kind of without that kind of grounding so I'd say that I see uh, Lorenzo Doria has got a, a question about um, what about subsumption of knowledge production? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think uh, Tony was already really talking about that. And and uh, you can talk about it, you know, sort of just within capitalist firms. But Tony is really taking it uh, into uh, a, a dimension where we have to kind of rethink the, the the state forms and the relationship between the state and these uh, these seven firms that are making a, making a lot of making a lot of profit and and so on. So no, I think a real subsumption of knowledge production um, is something to something to pursue. And and one one last thought about shadows. Um, uh, there are the pseudo concepts which I think are really uh, destructive of our well being, but I think shadows often are. Uh, um, observable realities of the world like loneliness and indifference and uh, leveling and the meltdown of differences. But what I think when sociology and critic people talk about those, any egalitarianism, when they talk about these features of our world, connecting them to capitalism is a complex move that's often missing. So you don't so you want to make that move. You don't want to get rid of the shadows because the shadows are observable. And so much of value is, you know, it's, <laughs> you, you got to think it, <laughs> but you can see the shadows often, but what, what, what the task is to bring them into the, the critical theory of, of society. Yeah, I, I think the shadow forms, I think a lot of social theory pays more attention to the shadow forms right. than to the constitutive form mm -hmm. forms. And uh, you know, there's a. I think there's a lot of terrific stuff in in Zimmel, uh, that essay on uh, you know metropolitan life and the money economy and and what that what that means. That is powerful, but also very depressing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, no, Zimmel, Weber. You know, Weber's got the idea of giganticism as a kind of. You know, but they're they're not. Of course, they're not going to be thematized as shadow forms because you. And you, you could just take that to... into feminism and uh, critical race theory. They're bringing up powerful features of our world, and what's often needed is to connect them to capitalism. And, and, and how you guys are bringing up, bring, you know, using the the language of the divided line as expressed via the cave <laughs> in terms of your shadow forms and moving from the empirically accessible shadow to the to the intelligible form <laughs> is like right there in the language. <laughs> right. Generally, we teach the cave, we teach the Plato's <laughs> cave most every semester. So it's, it's ready and, to hand. And 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 when the and when the intelligibles are presented, I think Marx presents intelligibles. Aristotle presents intelligibles very well. They sh they cast a light. I mean, that's the whole idea. Does it cast a light? Do you come away just in a cloud? You you can study utility all night and it casts no light. It, a good concept casts a light, and then it, you can see better. Um, the world around you. Frame it better. Anyway, I guess we're done. Okay, comrades. Uh, easily one of the fastest two and a half hours. I think we could go on for far longer. Uh, my thanks to Patrick and Jean for their two books, which have inspired these two broadcasts. My thanks to Ruth, Tom, and Tony for their erudite comments. Uh, a real engagement with some very serious issues which we should think about as Marxists who think and act as per the 11th thesis. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I've enjoyed it intensely. I've enjoyed it so much. I'm tempted to invite them back next week. <laughs> perhaps that would be too much. But thanks very much indeed.
and I hope you've enjoyed it and good night. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Stay on, stay on, stay on. Is Celeste gonna pick me up? Right. <laughs> okay, we're offline.